Hi, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 Rosalie Rendu Forum. It's wonderful to see so many people who have already joined us, and I'm sure many more will continue to do so over the next few minutes. Um, I'm sure a couple of people are still joining. I've stopped. I've started right on the, the, the dot of 6 p.m. Uh, my name is Sarah Boyle, uh, for those of you who don't know me, and I work in the social justice team with St Vincent de Paul Society New South Wales. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, as well as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us here this evening. I encourage you all to please put your name and the Aboriginal lands in which you're joining from in the chat, um, in the chat box, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen today. Thank you again. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Yvonne Weldon to do Welcome to Country. Thank, Thank you so very much, Yvonne. Um, as always, we've, for those of you who have joined in our previous uh, Rosalie Rendu forums, we've been um, lucky to have Yvonne for at least the last three years, potentially more than that, I think, Yvonne. Um, and it's just possibly. Always, yeah, it's been. Thank and, you. And it's always an honor events. to be a part of it. Thank you. So yeah, important. So, Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, it's Thank it's you. always wonderful to, to have that welcome to country, um, the beautiful welcome to countries that you give. So thank you. I would now like to introduce Saimi Jong as the facilitator for tonight's event. Saimi is the communications coordinator for the Sydney Alliance. She focuses on their Voices for Power campaign, which centers marginalized communities in Western Sydney in decision-making when it comes to local climate solutions. Voices for Power is a campaign that St Vincent de Paul Society New South Wales is also actively involved in. Before joining the Sydney Alliance, Samy advocated for climate justice in the Pacific with the not-for-profit Jubilee Australia Research Centre. Prior to that, she worked as an investigative journalist at Choice and in editorial roles at the Sydney Morning Herald. She has also written for The Guardian and climate change magazine Sweaty City, among other publications and received the, the Walkley Award for the Student Journalist of the Year in 2015. It's lovely to have you with us, Amy. Uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to you facilitating for tonight. Uh, um, and I wanted to acknowledge that I'm facilitating tonight from Wangal country. And I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and I pay my respects to the Mongol people and their ongoing connection to country, um, which is especially important to reflect on as we launch into these conversations about climate justice and what that really means. <clears throat> so welcome to tonight's forum. Welcome to our special guests and distinguished panelists who I'll introduce shortly. And welcome to all the representatives from St. Vincent de Paul Society, including state council and board members and society members, volunteers, employees, and supporters. To everyone here tonight, it's great to have you here and welcome. So this evening, we'll discuss our dramatically changing climate. In recent years, our communities endured, have endured more frequent and severe weather events, including devastating floods, droughts, bushfires, and heat waves. And as each disaster unfolds, it becomes clearer that it's marginalized people and communities who are impacted the most. I've heard climate change described as a threat multiplier, as it exacerbates existing structural inequalities and injustices. And this is what our speakers will really be focusing on tonight. We also know that people living on this continent are becoming increasingly concerned Two thirds agree we should be doing more to address climate change. So this forum is an opportunity to hear from experts who will explore how we can respond to climate change in ways that avoid widening inequality and instead build resilience amongst those who are most at risk. But before we begin with our speakers, we'll have a short spiritual reflection led by Jacinta McGrath, who is a part of the St. Vincent de Paul, New South Wales State Youth Team. Thank you, Sammy. Um, so 
Tonight, it's fitting that as we meet tonight to discuss our visions and actions for an equitable and sustainable future, we begin by reflecting on the life and actions of the namesake of our event, Blessed Rosalie Rundu. 220 years after she began her work with the Daughters of Charity, empowered to act by a vision much the same as ours. Jean-Marie Rendu was born in 1786 on a small property in the mountains of France, the eldest of four daughters. The French Revolution began when she was only three years old and her family quickly became a refuge for those fleeing persecution, including many priests. Jean-Marie was just 10 years old when her father and sister died, but she stepped up to support her mother and younger sisters. During this time, she witnessed the work of the Daughters of Charity at her local hospital, and inspired by their goodwill, she joined them when she was 16. Jean-Marie was given the name Sister Rosalie and travelled to Paris to work in the slums of the Mouffetard district, where she worked for the next 54 years. Rosalie dedicated her heart and soul to her varied work in service of the poor, sick and suffering. It is said that with one hand she received from the rich and with the other gave to the poor, a teaching which she shared with all of those who she met. Rosalie was a mentor to Frederick Osenham and his friends who founded the St. Vincent de Paul Society in 1833. She supported the group to reflect on their spiritual teaching and embody this through their actions, in introducing them to poor families who would benefit from their assistance. Her influence has remained a key aspect of the society's works and continues today across all of our campaigns, projects and advocacy. Rosalie's desire to create equity between rich and poor remains an important lesson for us more than 150 years after her passing, which we can apply to our work in the climate justice area today. Climate injustice disproportionately affects the marginalised and disadvantaged in society. You need only consider examples from this year where the devastating impacts and loss of life caused by the floods in Southern Asia, particularly in Pakistan, where more than 40% of the population live in slums, more than 33 million were impacted through displacement, loss of infrastructure and economic loss. So too, in our own backyard, those who are marginalised have been more significantly impacted by climate disasters in recent years. Those who are homeless are ex have been exposed to air pollution from the 2019 bushfires. Those who are living in poverty and are unable to replace their belongings lost in the floods and those who have been impacted repeatedly over the last two years, many unable to ensure their homes and belongings for damage and destruction because of location or financial challenges. While it can no longer be denied that climate change is an issue in desperate need of our attention, to create an equitable and sustainable future, we must remember that Rosalie's teachings and consider both the human and environmental impacts of climate change as we strive for justice. Climate change is not simply an environmental issue. It is also a social justice issue. As we continue our work with the St. Vincent de Paul Society, embark on new journeys to advocate for and take action towards creating climate justice, we acknowledge the influence of Rosalie's work, reminding us to hunt down poverty in order to give human, humanity its dignity, in order to create a more just and sustainable future for all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jacinta. Now, before I go to our panelists, a note to our listeners, feel free to put questions for them in the chat while they're speaking, and I'll look to these later in the forum. So first up, we have Professor Anne Paulina, who is a Niginya Wadwa woman from the Kimberley region of Western Australia. She is co-chair of Indigenous Studies and Senior Research Fellow of the Nulungu Institute at the University of Notre Dame. As chair of the Matawara Fitzroy River Council, Anne is an active community leader, human and earth rights advocate and filmmaker. Anne holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Indigenous Wellbeing, a Doctor of Philosophy in First Law, Master of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, 
a Master of Education and a Master of Arts in Indigenous Social Policy. Anne is also a signatory to the Redstone Statement 2010, which she helped draft at the first International Summit on Indigenous Environmental Philosophy. As a Peter Cullen Fellow for Water Leadership, she was awarded a laureate from the Women's, Women's World Summit Foundation in Geneva in 2017. Anne believes we can dream together as human beings and start to live in harmony with each other and with our non-human families. Welcome, Anne. Hi, so Anne, um, the first question goes to you. Um, first Nations people have cared for country waterways, seas and skies for tens of thousands of years. How can we better integrate First Nations traditional practices of custodianship and caring for country in our response to climate change? Thank you very much, Sami. In Broome, which is my home and the lands of the Jukun and Yaru people, uh, one of the things we say um, as the Indigenous people is the land is alive, it has agency, and so therefore we involve with it um, through a process of engaging through deep respect and building that relationship. When I introduced myself in my language, I said, I am a woman who belongs to the Fitzroy River in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. Now that is showing you that we as Indigenous people are born into a world where we are connected through not just relationship but obligation to care about everything around us so when we are born as indigenous people where i come from we are given a jarinj or a totem which is a non-human being a creature that we are bonded to for life and that creature teach us how to be fully human so what we're talking about in this ancient indigenous wisdom which has been here from the beginning of time is that indigenous people have learned to live in a deep relationship with nature because we see ourselves as part of nature so these values these ethics these codes of conduct taught us and teaches us how to self-regulate our behavior so that we look after the commons for the greater good of all of us not just for a few so we come from a different philosophical um, perspective but what Indigenous leaders like myself are saying, not just in this country, but globally, is that this is ancient Indigenous wisdom that needs to come in to the problem solving and the solution making with climate change, because we're dealing with complexity and we need collective wisdom. And why would you not need the oldest wisdom in the world? So that's what we want to share. That's what we want to talk about. That's what I'm happy to take questions on. But really what we're saying is that we have not only just relationships, but leadership governance models that showed that we needed to look after our estates from a bio regional framework. And that's where a lot of my work is happening today. I think we all need a process to come together in the regions. And if we've just been watching the floods and communities responding, they're not waiting for government. People are looking at this reciprocal economy, this ethics of care, of love and attention for each other and for the world around us. So that's what I want to share tonight. And let's see if we get some questions. But thank you very much for introducing me. Thanks, Anne. And it really is just so valuable to have those forms of um, knowledge really acknowledged. Um, and next, we'll go to Dr. Kim Lu. Um, who has extensive experience as a general practitioner. Um, she's been leading the way in increasing awareness and solving the health problems from climate change in her community in Western Sydney and beyond. Kim is Chair of Doctors for the Environment Australia for New South Wales and the ACT. In 2019, Doctors for the Environment Australia declared a climate health emergency and highlighted the impact of climate change especially through the natural disaster of extreme weather events. Last year, Doctors for the Environment issued a report on how climate change affects mental health in Australia. 
Kim's work reveals how wide ranging the health implications of climate change and natural, natural disasters are, and how our response to climate change needs to be direct, preventative and holistic. Welcome Dr. Kim Liu. Hi. Hi. So Hi. I live and work on the land of the Dark Nation. And can you hear me properly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the when we go to medical school, we learn about the biolog biological determinants of health. And very soon I could see that the social determinants of health, mainly because my mother's a social worker. And the environmental determinants of health really are impactful on human health. Dr. Swill Environment started in 2004 when the founders realised at that time that human health is inextricably linked to our environment. I work in northwestern Sydney where we've had the flood, the heat waves to start off with. Uh, then the bushfires with 80 days of smoke, then COVID, and then three sets of floods. And I am on the front line. And I have felt sort of anxiety, grief, hopelessness, frustration, and anger throughout this time because of the lack of action. And every day I see patients, including today, I saw one of my patients who still looking after her daughter and her son who have just had a house built from the bushfires from two and a half years ago and the house is now mouldy and they're surrounded by flood and it is so devastating for me on a day-to-day -day basis to see my patients impacted by floods and just seeing their anxiety when the rain falls even if it's actually just a very light fall because they've had to evacuate twice and it is just desperately heartbreaking and we know what can be done we know that climate change impacts on every single organ in our body including our skin uh, we have so much data now that heat waves increase the risk of domestic violence increase the risk of suicide increase the risk of self-harm, especially if it's humid. And all these studies are coming in now and we need more studies in this area so we can see how to prevent all of these things happening. Um, and we know that heat waves also increase the risk of heart attacks, kidney failure. So the data, there is enough data from even air pollution gathered since the 1970s from America. There needs to be research about how we can manage it, but there is enough data to do more about it. We are at the infancy of adaptation. We know that all these crises have disrupted the medical system so that we have, my, have, my friends have had general practices who are impacted during the fires and the floods. And we've had patients who had their healthcare disrupted because they can't get to me. I've, during the floods, I had patients who had to drive two hours to get around to me to bypass the Richmond and Windsor Bridge. Patients who've um, just sort of like refurbished their house and it had been flooded again. And it is, yeah, it's devastating. That's why part of the reason I've spent my life in advocacy since really 2015 um, because I found it's impacted me and for me not to feel just sort of unsettled and anxious all the time and including all our doctors who now understand and it is actually Doctors for Environment has been lobbying the colleges, um, all the colleges and including the AMA. So the AMA did declare the climate emergency in 2019 because of lobbying by Doctors for the Environment and we still we're still educating because you require education for people to act. And so we work to educate because um, we lo lobby superannuation companies, banks and politicians. We do community meetings to educate the population because as 
as, um, as doctors, we don't have a vested interest besides wanting better care and uh, for our patients. Um, so in a way, we're in a powerful place to lobby. And, and more and more people, more and more doctors and nurses and the, and the health sector are now working the areas to push adaptation. Because if we don't adapt, people will be sick and more people will die. So the more hope and the more work we can do, because the health sector is also 7% of Australia's emissions, um, the more we can help the population to be healthier. Yeah, Thank exactly. Thanks, Kim. Um, it really goes to show that not only does climate change impact people physically through the loss of their homes or even their lives, it also has very serious psychological impact. So I'm very glad you're here to talk to us more about that later. Thanks, Kim. Um, next, we have Kelly Court, who strives for a more sustainable and just future where the planet and people can thrive together. For the past 17 years, Kelly has specialised in international climate change negotiations, domestic climate change mitigation and resilience policy, energy policy, con community advocacy and campaigning, with a focus on better social and environmental outcomes. Kelly has worked as a senior political advisor, climate change program manager at Worldwide, Worldwide Fund for Nature, or WWF, and now as a program director, climate and energy with the Australian Council of Social Service, or ACOS. She's also worked at the United Nations in government and in academia. Kelly has a master of international business and a bachelor's of science. She was named Energy Efficiency Champion in the National Energy Efficiency Awards 2020 for her outstanding contribution to the field of energy, effic energy efficiency, management and demand response. Hi, Kelly. Um, you've described climate change as a major threat to ending poverty and reducing inequality. Can you tell us more about your concerns and what you've been focusing on in your work with ACOP? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Sami. And thank you uh, for having me here today. I'd also just like to acknowledge that I'm on Jagger and Turbul lands um, here in Brizzy and pay my respects um, to traditional owners um, and their leaders, past, present and emerging. Um, yeah, so look, ACROS sees climate change and the slow, poorly managed transition to a net zero economy as a major threat to achieving our vision of ending poverty and inequality. Um, we see climate change as causing immediate and accelerated damage, including through more severe and frequent heat waves, bushfires, droughts, sea level rises and floods. I mean, we, you know, we can obviously see what's happening around us at the moment with floods. Um, it's not only a threat to our environment, which sustains our life, but it threatens, as we've just heard um, from Dr. Kim, it threatens people's lives and health, homes, livelihoods, quality of life, employment, and it also increases risks and burdens for future generations. And we know that people experiencing financial or social disadvantage are impacted by climate change, first, worst and longest, because they have fewer... Um, resources to cope, adapt and recover. It's already exposing them to greater levels of harm and disadvantage and is imposing particular threats to First Nations communities and to the future of our young people. Um, people with fewer resources and capabilities um, have, as I said, have less money, choice, power, connections to cope, adapt and recover. And what we're concerned about is that people experiencing poverty and disadvantage, and what we're seeing is that but even bef before natural disasters, when they're experiencing poverty and disadvantage, they're actually being left off worse off after the event. But we're also seeing it can drive more people into poverty. So, for example, some of the things we're seeing is the lack of or under insurance uh, and the rejection of insurance claims are leaving people unable to live in or to repair their homes. 
Um, there's loss of employment through disruptions and closures of local business, damage to homes and contents, loss of rental tenancy and inability to meet high bond payments and rents, uh, increased pressure on public housing and waiting lists, and increased living costs due to the rising costs of food and other essential services affected by natural disasters. And we've seen analysis by Deloitte's Access Economics that's found that the lack of climate action over the next 50 years will cost the economy 3.2 trillion. But they also found that the social cost is actually equal to this and potentially greater. Um, so without rapid, fair and inclusive action on climate change, these threats will continue to worsen and cause greater poverty and inequality into the future. So in terms of your question um, about what's ACOS doing, so we're focus focusing on a range of areas. So we're looking at policies and measures that can help people and communities better respond, recover and build resilience to worsening extreme weather. And so some of the areas we're focusing on is measures to help people immediately meet their needs. So increasing disaster recovery payments, increasing job seeker and other income support payments, for example. Um, we're also looking at measures to support the community sector organizations to better respond to disasters, um, improve people's resilience. So we're, we're for example, we're calling for local climate resilience hubs um, so that the community can be in charge and they know they're the people in the community better. Um, so that's one of the things we're calling for, improving disaster resilience of the community sector and providing affordable and accessible insurance. And then we're also working on a raft of policies to ensure that people experiencing financial and social disadvantage benefit from the transition to a clean economy and to improve the lives of people facing disadvantage. Um, there's an opportunity here where we can actually create more affordable and healthy and reliable energy, housing and transport, um, and to provide access to jobs in the new economy. But we just have to make sure that we're putting people with the least at the front and center of these policies. Thanks, Kelly, that's so important. Um, that's exactly right, to put people with the least at the front and center. Um, now I'll introduce Suzanne Nichols. Um, she's the president of the St. Vincent de Paul Society New South Wales St. Carthage's Conference in Lismore. Suzanne joined the society shortly after the 2017 Lismore floods. Over the last four, she, uh, sorry, over the last four years, she led the St. Carthage's Conference as they worked tirelessly to help people impacted by bushfires, floods and COVID lockdowns. Suzanne has seen firsthand how increasingly severe weather events have impacted people, already, um, people already struggling to make ends meet. From day one of the floods, Suzanne and other St. Vincent de Paul Society members were at the recovery center, submitting flood applications for their community and visiting flood impacted streets to offer support and practical assistance. Despite having lost almost everything within their own conference facilities due to the floods, St. Carthage has rallied together to move to the Matthew Talbot Distri Distribution Centre factory at Gunalaba to ensure the community would continue to be cared for. Since the floods, Suzanne and the St. Carthage's conference have supported the Lismore community in a range of ways from buying building materials, paint for internal walls, and Bunnings vouchers for flooring, to paying for essential trade services and fuel vouchers. On Saturdays, members continue to visit flood affected communities to offer emotional support and assistance. Hi, Suzanne. Hi, Sammy. As a member of the society, you played a major role in responding to people impacted by floods in the Northern Rivers earlier this year. I know Vinnie's assisted 2,180 households in the weeks immediately following the floods and continues to support families today. Can you tell us about the way in which people were and continue to be affected and what kinds of things have helped or hindered the community in coming together in the face of this disaster? Thank you, Sammy. 
it was a catastrophic event um, and it affected all the Northern Rivers. Uh, you know, many people have seen the images of the um, Tinney Army and that was the day one when people knew that we had to work to save each other in this flood. People were very generous with their time once we could get back into uh, to the CBD. Uh, people were there helping clean, people were distributing water and uh, meals for people to, that could, had nothing. They had nothing. They'd lost, we had loss of life. We had loss of homes, cars. Schools couldn't operate. Uh, the, the employment, a lot of people lost their employment. Doctors, dental practice was all gone. Supermarkets, petrol stations. And it's amazing how much you take for granted until it's not there. You just can't pop down and, and get what you need. So the community spirit was amazing and still is. You know, it works together to support each other. The trouble, I think, or one of the big issues, and as, as Kelly has already um, talked about it, is that people are marginalised. The people who are suffering, struggling to keep their families going, live in the cheaper rents, uh, which are around the CBD, or the homelessness live in the centre of the CBD or, or on the fringes of it. And our CBD was wiped out. So those people were immediately displaced. And uh, they went to the evacuation centre, but after that, then they were moved to different places, as far away as Brisbane. And so they lost their connections, they lost their network. Some of them are not coming back, which is very sad. Um, but, you know, rentals were so um, limited before the flood. And now, of course, the land, lots of landlords have decided not to repair their houses. Um, and so people haven't got a home or some of them have repaired the houses and, and have put up their rents. So that's making it even more difficult for people. Uh, the, the, I guess that the, what this community is doing is they're supporting each other. We have a Resilient Lismore Facebook page and um, lots of people share on that, sharing materials that they've taken out of their houses that they don't want anymore. Um, you know, on offering them to other people. And they're certainly sharing ideas of how to rebuild homes um, in a better way, in a flood resistant way. Um, talking about where they can source these materials. Uh, so, but the problem is, of course, is sourcing materials limited, and that's not just because of the floods, but it, you know, it was during COVID too. And the other thing is the limited access to tradespeople because there's so many people wanted. Um, you know, we've still, we've got a lot of people who have gone back to their homes, but they're living in homes with no walls, uh, no electricity or one PowerPoint. Um, a family of eight that we know that's living in the house and they're using an esky, you know, and that, so that has to be refilled with ice every day. Um, people who are living in tents, tents in the downstairs of their house, or tents next to their house that the house that burnt down during the flood. If you know, it seems unbelievable, but it did. Um, we had a lady that we helped that was lived in the cavity of, of her roof for two months with the, with the cats because she had nowhere else to go. Many people um, that weren't affected took people uh, people they didn't know into their homes and and um, supported them. So. Those people who, you know, who are lucky enough, I suppose, lucky to go back into their homes, then they're struggling to purchase uh, essential items, bedding, white goods. So we've worked really hard with the help, I have to say, of the Lions Club and our emergency relief funding to, to support these people. But they're, unfortunately, people think that everyone's there's a lot of people far worse off than themselves. So we're really having to go out and make contact with them. You talked about things that were hindering and I think the, the hindrance is that there were limited rentals before and now there's even less. Um, uh, I think there's a not, um, we're trouble having trouble finding out what the future of Lismore is going to be because some decisions 
um, are taking a long time to be made, like the acquisition of Crown land, resettlement or buybacks. People don't know whether to actually invest in rebuilding their home or not. Um, anecdotally, some of the practices of the insurance companies are not good. Those people who are lucky enough to have insurance because flood insurance was way out of the, uh, the reach of many people and businesses. Um, and, and, and the insurance companies saying that, yes, they're going to pay out and then a reneging on that. Um, it, it, so it's, it's, it's been a struggle, but you know, the community spirit uh, is, is there, very generous donations um, from across the nation we've received. And of course, we just keep working, keep working, keep smiling. The, uh, one of our big problems, and it was touched on by Dr. Kim, is people's mental health. Um, you know, when we, right. we talk, yeah. people talk about the rain coming or we're going to have so many days, you can see people's anxiety levels rising and really concerned about that, both adults and children. But um, yeah. we'll keep working. Yeah, thanks, Suzanne. And it's really inspiring to hear about people coming together in the community to um, try to help out in these really horrible situations. Um, so now we're going to go to, I'll go to the questions in the chat. Um, I'll start with the first one that came up. Um, this is a question from Pravin, who is from India, who writes, like Aboriginal people, Hindus believe that humans must live in harmony with nature, which involves a replenishment of what we use. Unhappily, with the increasing population in the last two centuries, this harmony has been disrupted. Our lifestyles have become wasteful of resources. How can we get more people to accept the importance of recycling systems to reduce this consumption? Is this possible? I'm going to throw this one first to Anne. Great. Look, thank you for this. I, I guess you know, it's something we actually have to learn in terms of changing our whole worldview. I was just listening to the stories from the other beautiful presenters, and what we're really talking about are symptoms of climate chaos. You know what I mean? Like, at the moment, what we're trying to do is look at the end point rather than the creation of the chaos and why we're in such a state where we have so much dis-ease around climate change. And um, I know recycling is you know, very, very important, but so are the other things that we need to do. So I guess for me, I've had to learn that myself. How do we self-regulate our behavior for the greater good of everybody and everything around us? So I think it's a little bit sort of going back in terms of values, ethics, clash of this and clash of that in terms of, I've actually had to question myself, do I really need that? Do I really need that? And if I do, um, you know, what else would I do with that form of um, capital? I guess, you know, consumption, sorry. So for me, I guess one of the things I'm really challenged by is that it's been- Sorry, Anne, I'm just gonna interrupt you just for a second because I think there's a lot of moving happening that's um, making it a bit difficult for us to hear. I think, right. I don't know if you're no moving problems. stuff around on your <laughs> desk, but yeah. Yeah, some, something was yeah. moving around. They've gone now, they came to pick something out. But um, right. I guess really what I want to deal with in this stories that we're all sharing is that we're in climate chaos because of the dis-ease of Mother Earth, of the planet, in terms of everything is out of control, it's out of whack. We cannot keep doing to nature what we are doing. All of the reports from IPBES, from IUCN, are saying these last bastions of biodiversity, which are being held under the stewardship of indigenous people are so vital to our humanity and the sustainability of not just our development, but our sustainability of our life ways. And I think really what we need to do is really look at the root cause. Why are we in this situation? Why is it business as usual? Why are we creating where I live right now potentially the largest man-made destruction on the planet by fracking a basin that's just going to reduce, uh, increase the emissions and create all of this uncertainty as well as toxins and poisons. Like we don't seem to be grappling with the real issues of what are we dealing with as planetary citizens, let alone Australians. 
So I think one of the big issues is to look at the root cause of this dis-ease because it's creating the symptoms that each um, speaker has shared. Why are we suffering with indigenous, you know, this sort of um, ill health, uh, social unwellness and all of this? We've got the wrong economic model here in this country. We all signed on a couple of months ago on the belief that our, um, our advisors, those that are controlling our de destination, would not be looking at bringing on new gas, new coal, and yet here we are destroying the earth systems, the energy systems that sustain all of us. So I guess, you know, what you're seeing today is that we're all sharing is that this is a wide spectrum. We're talking about the symptoms of dis-ease from climate chaos and climate wars, when we really need to be trapped, you know, attracting a conversation and a dialogue as Australians around how do we form this ethics of care. When you look at what Lismore did, it was the people that mobilized because of their love and their care for each other. We're seeing that now as we travel down the rest of the East Coast is that communities are struggling because there is no security and certainty from government with the way that they are living their lives as Australians. So there's a lot of chaos that we need to come together with. And this is what I'm saying is that we need these stories. People are testosterone out on science. They want to hear the stories that matter in our daily lives. So whether it's how do we, you know, stop the consumption of um, all of this food, I think we really need to get to the root cause, which is the destruction of the planet because we're continuing the old business as usual model. Um, the volunteers that come on and help all of us are doing this out of voluntary um, love and care for their community. These people need to have investment. We need to see this as a critical defense force for climate chaos around our nation. We are ignoring the science. We are ignoring indigenous wisdom. It's still business as usual, and we will continue to suffer because we are destroying nature at the very heart of where we live, love and work. So that's what I wanted to say. I always also wanted to just um, give my apologies to the panel because something urgent has come up. But I want to thank you all for being brave. I mean, doctors of the environment, the, the amount of evidence you're putting out there, you know, the fact that the United Nations said we need to declare that it is a right a human right to live in a place that is free from not just violence, but climate, chaos, poison, and all of this pollution. And yet we're doing the same thing. The wonderful work in Lismore, the work that ACOS is doing in advocating and brokering this transformative change. Seriously, um, leaders, we need a different model. We can't be business as usual. We need to wrap our love and attention around our community volunteers. We need to pay them a decent wage because they are putting their lives on the risk to defend our communities and our people and our families. And we st start to need to value each other as citizens who want to dream a different way for us to have climate justice, a climate chance and peace. So I very much apologize for going off right now, but um, I've just had an emergency and I need to go, but I wanna thank you all for your love and your attention and your ethics of care to your community because it needs leaders like us to what we call wake up the snake wake up the consciousness of the people to bring the communities with us and Lismore you're doing it and uh, Gumulga and you know all of those beautiful places over there keep up this work because I don't see business as usual changing anytime soon the people need to speak up local government needs to get back on board but we need to do this from a regional perspective not a state or a federal because we know what it means with an ethics of care and love for each other so yeah. thank you all. I apologize for leaving, but I must join something else right now. So That's thank okay. you very much. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Anne. It's been really valuable to have your insights on this forum as well. And we need to look after our doctors, especially our GPs who are charging $49 for Medicare rebate. I can't get a trademan to work for $150 an hour. We need to love our doctors and look after our nurses and our childcare and our old people. So thank you very much. Thank you. This is what Rosalie stood for, yeah. to give voice to the vulnerable, to raise yeah. 
poverty and to come together for change. Thank you. Gully or Marble. Thank you, Anne. Um, and Anne mentioned, you know, the, the community workers and the volunteers who are doing so much to pick up the pieces um, when these disasters are happening. And, and that goes to one of our, another question that we have from Lucy, um, who says, we have seen that it is often the community who is picking up the pieces after natural disasters and other impacts of climate change with a lack of action from government. Where should responsibility sit when responding to climate change? Um, and I'll throw to you first, Suzanne. Sorry, I was just getting the microphone back on. Uh, look, I mean, I suppose I, it wasn't just, some, and it isn't just invincible. I mean, I don't think the government levels at any stage could have provided the assistance that we've, we've been able to provide without all the groups in Lismore that are working together. Um, there are so many, every, every you know, rotary lines, um, country women, Vinnie's Salvation Army have all got out there and uh, helped because a government bodies are so slow, aren't they? They're so slow to, to get um, mobilised. And so that's where we come in and do it. But, um, and, but I think that with what's happened here in Lismore, um, and I mean, we've always had floods, but this flood was catastrophic, you know, it was, and definitely uh, we're looking that, you know, now they're, they're talking about the next major one could be even more, a higher. So um, we certainly have to have somebody, um, whether it's, it's the local government, is, our council are really working hard, but we certainly have to have, to have some decisions made and very soon about um, what we can do. Because uh, as Professor Anne said, we can't just keep going on and on and on. It's not working. We have to change what we're doing. And I think the government has to, to government bodies have to, policies have to change to, to be able to do that. And it has to be done in a timely fashion. Very well said, Suzanne. Um, next, I'm gonna ask a question from Paul Burton, who is the St. Vincent de Paul Society, New South Wales State President. So his question is, I noticed that an immense low pressure vortex, a parched area of dry mud, and a bushfire scene are part of the graphics on our flyer promoting this evening's event. The effects of climate events such as these are often dealt with at a local level, um, which we've just been talking about. But from a social justice perspective, do we need a stronger focus on the plight of our neighbors in the Western Pacific regions as they face rising sea levels and experience the adverse effects on traditional food sources? Um, so I guess in a nutshell, he's asking, does a focus on responding to urgent local issues mean we aren't giving these broader issues the attention they need? Um, and I'm going to throw to you first, Kelly, um, given this is about a social justice perspective. Yeah, thanks, Sammy. And look, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and I think it's a complex answer. I think, unfortunately, under the previous government, we saw our contribution to supporting developing countries reduce um, when all countries had an agreement to increase the amount they spend on their GDP um, was meant to increase. And we didn't see that happen under the previous government. So I think it's really important that under this federal government that we do see that commitment to increase financial support to developing countries um, for that support to not only help become more resilient, but also help those countries in their transition as well so that they can also transition to cleaner, cleaner economies. So I think that's really important. The, the question, uh, um, you know, I think it's, I, I think we need to be doing both because the challenge for Australia is that if we don't um, invest in the infrastructure 
both physical and social infrastructure to help our communities recover, rebuild and reduce risk, then the financial impact for our government will become increasingly worse and we will have less finances to help developing countries, right? So we need to be investing significantly here and in, in our communities overseas. So I, I don't think it's, a, it's an either or. We absolutely need to be doing both. And I think, you know, governments really need to start reprioritising um, our funding and, and how we think about this going, going forward. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I, I think you're absolutely on the mark when you say that it's not an either or situation. There are vulnerable people here on this continent as well as our Pacific neighbours and it's all just really important to address. Um, another question we had from one of our listeners is, could we refer to people displaced during floods, fires or natural disasters as climate refugees? Dr. Kim Liu, do you want to respond to that one? Uh, you know, it's, it is the word refugee has been so demonised in Australia. It really has. And, uh, but it's the truth. There are people who are escaping from natural disasters and we need to somehow associate care and caring with the word refugee um, because people are leaving places that they would rather stay in but have become not habitable. Um, so I know it's not a direct answer with the question, um, but so many things in Australia have been politicised when they shouldn't be. Um, when things, um, Australia, the language has been, and we've become in a way such a brutal society that there is, people don't value each other as much. And, um, and really care for land and so like our first nations so did not answer the question sorry but it's just my point of view on well no, you definitely you did answer the question <laughs> that was yeah that was and, and sammy i'm i'm happy to jump in yeah, well. I, I mean i certainly agree with um dr kim that that the word has become demonized in australia but it's certainly the under the Paris Agreement for Action on Climate Change, it's a key part of the Paris Agreement that we need to, that countries need to be um, looking at how do we deal with climate refugees. Um, a lot of that is from other countries coming in internally, but we also need to look internally as well for climate refugees. And, you know, we heard Suzanne describe um, quite well the impact on Lismore, where people have had to leave Lismore um, and, uh, you, you know, you can consider them internally as, as climate refugees. Um, and we will, we will soon see that not just our Pacific, Pacific neighbours, but Torres Strait Islander communities and other First Nations communities that are in islands around Northern Australia are already being significantly impacted. And the reality is, is that, you know, potentially in the next 10 years, they will be forced to leave their homelands. Um, and, you know, it's just heartbreaking hearing from those communities um, what it means for their culture, um, having to leave their, you know, their traditions where they grew up, where their ancestors are. Um, and so it's, again, it's something that our government needs to be thinking about um, and building into policies, both, both internal climate refugees and external climate refugees. Yeah. So, and that, oh, did you? I mean, just say, if we don't adapt, we'll basically have no place. There'll be large swathes in Australia not livable. That's why, that's part of the reason we, we need for people to understand who who actually pull the levers of power that this will be the case.
Yeah, thanks, Kelly and Kim. Um, I think they're really, uh, really good points that you've made. Um, and and what you said, Kelly, about people having to leave their ancestral homes goes into um, a question that Rob Crosby has asked in the chat. Um, it's a shame Anne's not here, but he asks, how do we reconcile the Indigenous worldview of seeing people as inextricably connected to the land with the brutal reality of capitalism that prioritises profits over people and the environment? Um, that is a huge question. Um, does, does anyone, is anyone jumping to answer that one? I, I think, I think actually it was answered before, um, yeah. you know, really the governments have to stop focusing on capitalism and need to and this this idea of growth constant growth and needs to refocus on frameworks around sustainability fairness um and well-being and if you know if we if we have that as our framework um then i think we will be in a much better a much better place but we, yes the current economic theory is just uh, absolutely not working thanks kelly another question we have from janice stokes is about um, the insurance industry so she asks has the insurance industry provided any indication of advocating for climate change action their profit would be greatly impacted by climate change, wouldn't it? Um, Suzanne, do you have a response to this one? Well, the, the insurance companies in, in, in the last flood event have, have not been very, um, well, people haven't had positive experiences with them. Yeah, and it's, it's almost like they're still they're they're still thinking money, they're still thinking profits. It's not what people need. It's not looking at you know being really upfront with what they they they're going to do. Their their delay tactics here. Their um, people signing off on on yes. The insurance company says we'll offer you this much. They sign off it and then they come back a later, a month, two months later, and say, oh no, we're not giving you that. So um, they certainly um, are, I'm not sure that they're um, they're uh, working with climate change, but I, I think that the the dollar sign is always the most important thing thing to them. And it's um certainly needs to be some policy made around insurance companies and their practices. And that's become very um, apparent here in, in with people that, you know, first of all, the, the amounts they want to charge and then they won't um, fulfill the policy. So, um, no, I, I'm not sure what, what how we can do that, but I certainly think that the government needs to step in somewhere, uh, the federal government, about and the, and the insurance industry. And that, of course, is a personal point of view. Um, Sammy, I, I can jump in again here. The, the Insurance Council of Australia are the council itself, they're not individual insurance companies, um, have actually been doing quite a lot of research and advocacy around what's needed um, to reduce risk. Um, but I think the biggest issue is, is that the it, under insurance is based on a risk-based pricing method. Um, which essentially is that you raise premiums in high risk areas and the idea is that you then motivate people to lower their risk by mitigating the risks or moving but that just ignores the reality that climate change is increasing risk in most regions in Australia um, and that there are significant barriers to people especially people on low income being able to mitigate or to move so you know our our current um, insurance pricing scheme just does not work and it's 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 just not going to work as as extreme weather events increase so uh, ACOS has been calling for a review of insurance to reconsider this risk-based pricing and also look at ways to help 
make insurance more affordable uh, for people on low income. But, you know, also, also to Suzanne's point, I mean, I think insurance companies need to be a little bit more sympathetic. I understand that with, you know, these significant events on top of significant events that, um, you know, that it's costing a lot to insurance companies and the economy, um, but compassion, you know, is important as well. Thanks, Kelly. Dr. Kim Liu, did you have um, anything else to add? Um, in terms of how we, we need a sovereign wealth fund to actually redirect a lot of for, because our fossil fuel industries collect so much profits to go overseas that and if you look at Norway, and this is, is this is I'm talking about funding. Like we could do so much, while we actually, it, the Australian government needs to really be brave, and move money around in the right direction, so that um, because there's an, yeah, our governments haven't been brave because there've been nefarious forces so powerful for so long that because I've been seeing politicians with it since 2015, it's not brave, that we need to act, this is why advocacy is so important, and we need every single sector advocating, is we need to embolden our politicians to make decisions that provide care for our community. They're there to serve us, but at the moment, a lot of them aren't. <laughs> um, yeah, you mentioned that, you know, a lot of money could be spent on um, ways of uh, adapting to climate change and things to stop things getting worse in terms of inequality. Um, and Rob has asked, how could $250 billion in tax cuts be used to address climate change? Yeah, have I got a policy suite for you, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and look, it's not just the tax cuts, building on what Kim was just saying, um, the currently governments in Australia um, and primarily the, the federal government, are spending more than $11.8 billion in fossil fuel subsidies um, that are going to subsidise coal and gas companies and the use of fossil fuels vehicles, um, that, you know, that money could be spent elsewhere, especially in accelerating the transition to a clean economy. But in terms of the, the 250 billion, um, you know, as I'm as I mentioned before, we need to be raising things like job seeker and associated payments so that people on the lowest incomes in Australia can at least be above the poverty line and you know have that ability to be able to afford housing and food and I doubt it will get them to the insurance. Um, you know, we need policies there. Um, we need local climate resilience hubs. We need to increase disaster recovery payments. Uh, we need to invest more in um, uh, health supports um, and, and mental health. I mean, we've, we've heard about the mental health impacts. We need more social and affordable housing. Um, yeah, that, that money could be spent in a lot of ways that can really help people um, become more resilient as well as accelerate the transition to, to renewable energy and the clean economy. Thanks, Kelly. Suzanne, do you have any anything to add to that of what all of that money could be used for? Well, I just picking up with Kelly with the increase of job seeker payments during um, COVID when they were doubled, the the number of people on job seeker coming to um, Vinnie's for assistance dramatically dropped. 
it, there, it was incredible that the, the drop in that it was more parenting payment and age pensions that were coming, pensioners coming to us. So certainly uh, they need an increase and in social housing. I just, I, I can't understand why we can't get more. I mean, I know it, it costs money, but they talk about it, but, but, you know, it's been a problem for a long while and now it's a, an enormous problem um, since bushfires, since floods. So, uh, you know, that they will be my two things, increasing payments for, for people to live, um, be able to live, not, not live uh, outrageously, but live. Uh, um, just the basic needs to pay for things and, and the social housing. Yeah, it's remarkable how many people are still um, really struggling um, in a country like ours where there's plenty of wealth to go around if we wanted it to. Um, Kim, did you have anything to add to that question? Absolutely agree with everyone. Um, it's just seeing my patients choosing between um, by having turning on the air conditioner and paying for their drugs. You know, it's really simple. Like this is, we're not at Liz, in Lismore where it's completely devastating, but we have been flooded as well. And I've got patients just living in such precarity. It's, we just need, yeah, it's, yeah, this is why I'm so glad so many people are in advocacy now because we need to change the people in parliament, like someone said, and we have partially, but because we know we've got a state election coming soon, we all need to work in this area um, because we need to make Australia a place where everyone can live safely. And at the moment, they're not. And um, so Yeah, thanks, Kim. Um, Jana Stokes asks, um, why, oh, so there's a $3.2 trillion impact to the economy due to climate change. Why does it still appear to not be a priority for government? What do you think is holding them back? Kelly. So look, I, I, think it, I think that's true of the previous federal government. There was strong climate denialism within many within that government, not all within the, the coalition government. Um, and, you know, the fossil fuel industry has a lot of resources and a lot of influence, right? So, um, which, you know, there was, a, I noticed there was a question earlier about that influence as well. And, you know, we, we've, we've seen that, but look, I think I'm heartened to see that the new federal government is committed to act, probably not act as fast as what some of us want to, but, you know, they, they since they've come in in May, we've seen them implement a Climate Change Act, which has a more ambitious target of a 43% emission reductions by 2030, um, and that they have committed that being a base, um, a floor, uh, and their intention is to exceed that. Um, and certainly they've put in mechanisms to help do that. We've seen a lot of independence come into the federal government where climate change was their number one priority and they're holding, uh, and along with the Greens, holding the federal government now to account. Um, we just saw today the Victorian um, state government announced a pre-election commitment of um, what was it 95 percent renewable energy by 2035 so basically no more coal-fired power stations and 95 percent renewables by 2035 that is absolutely what we need um, so we are seeing and and ACT is already there Tasmania already has close to 100 percent renewable energy so we are seeing the states move and now with the new federal government we are seeing action so so there is hope um, we just need to do it a little bit faster and we need to make sure it's fair and inclusive. I think that's the key thing now is, is to make sure that we don't increase inequality and that, in fact, we reduce poverty um, by being smart about the policies that we put in place. Thanks, Kelly. 
Kim or Suzanne, do you have something you'd like to add to that response? Um, I, I've been going backwards and forwards from Canberra since 2015, and I was just there not that long ago. And it was just such, so in a way, heartwarming that I could see staff and politicians who understood the problem. So they understand the problem federally and are putting money in and have got a department to look at climate resilience and adaptation. And they've hired people who uh, have worked in this area and are policy space outside the previous government. And I've got someone back in cleaning now. But um, so it is, it was hopeful. This is the most hopeful I've been um, since going backwards and forwards from Canberra where people just denied that there was a problem. Uh, so, and even at, um, in, at the council level, I'm more hopeful. So I think federal politics needs to be pushed further because the policies that are that will make the biggest difference are at a federal level. Um, a lot of the economy adaptation will be done at the state and council level, but policies that are significant for Australia's future are still significantly done at the federal level. So. Thanks, Kim. Well, it is good to hear about um, these notes of hope, especially after so long of kind of an overcast feeling when it comes to climate change policy. Um, so thank you both for your thoughts on that. Um, I want to go to Rhiannon's question. Um, she asks, many Vinnie's members assist people strugg struggling to pay their bills, especially their energy bills. With the cost of non-renewable energy sources predicted to rise, what impact will this have on people who are already doing it tough? Suzanne, would you like to start? They're going to do it tougher, aren't they? I mean, energy bills, and as mentioned, people are deciding whether they'll use um, heating or cooling or heating only, um, or will they, they, you know, pay for their uh, food? Um, and so, you know, the the people who are, are struggling, it's the energy bills, it's the rent, it's the cost of food. And of course, you know, we know through COVID, we know through bushfires, now we know through flood that, that um, food costs have gone, uh, risen dramatically. Um, fuel is another problem. And I, something I didn't mention before, because people have, were moved and housed in, in towns around us, as I said, as far away as Brisbane, people were having to pay fuel to come back to bring for employment or to bring the children back to school or to clean the house. So we had uh, um, a, a dramatic increase in the request for um, fuel vouchers. So uh, it's just another layer for them to have to, to find more money when they, they're, they're restricted with the money they've got. Um, I, I think it's going to be devastating for them. And, and sometimes the, the, their fuel, or their energy bill is so large and out of, their out of touch for them, they can't pay it, that they then just, they forget it. And, you know, then they come to us and it's, it's a, really a, a disastrous state. So we've got to look at how this is impacting and how we can help them. And of course, one way is to increase payments, um, you know. So that's, that's how I feel about it. It's just going to be, a bigger struggle for those who are already struggling. So we have to we have to factor something into the payments that they're receiving. That's a really good point, Suzanne. Uh, Kelly, <clears throat> sorry, Kelly or Kim, um, what impact will the the cost of rising uh, non-renewable energy sources have on people who are already doing it tough? Yeah, so, you know, Rhiannon's question is really good because we're seeing both gas and coal prices significantly increase. Um, a lot of it's got to do with the, the war in the Ukraine. It's, you know, astounding how one war can have such a significant impact um, 
well, devastating for the people in Ukraine, but also significant impact on the economy and, and the price of energy elsewhere. Um, and, and also unreliable fossil fuels. So that's the other key reason. So we're actually seeing coal-fired power stations shutting down because they're getting old and unreliable. Um, what we're seeing at a cost similar to what Suzanne is talking about um, is that people have all, who have already been depriving themselves of energy are trying even further. So more people are having fewer showers than they used to, um, not heating or cooling their home, going to bed early, um, turning off lights, um, not cooking certain foods, so not using ovens or stoves, using microwaves, you know, as, as ways to try and reduce their bill even further, or then make other sacrifices like not putting food on their table or going without medication. Um, and Dr. Kim can probably talk to that from the people that come to her. But, you know, we've heard from people that say when they get their energy bill, all they buy is bread and milk for the next two weeks because that's all they can afford. Um, so we're, we're really worried um, because it's only going to get worse. And as Suzanne described, the other cost of living pressures on top of that. Um, one, we've been advocating for a range of things, as Suzanne said, increasing job seeker, um, but we're also calling for investment and energy efficiency and renewable energy um, for low income housing. So public housing, community housing, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander housing, low income homeowners, private rental, um, because if we can help homes become more efficient and have access to renewable energy, then you're significantly reducing the amount of energy they use and also the cost of their bills. Um, so that's that's a really important one for us as well. Oh, and the other thing I should mention is, is energy debt. So even while people are trying to reduce, what we're seeing is more and more people go into energy debt. So there's more than 270,000 people in energy debt at the moment. And they are figures from earlier this year. We expect that to increase um, uh, as a result of winter and the rising energy prices. Um, people on energy hardship, their average debt is $1,700. And a quarter of those people, their debt is is above $2,500. That's a huge debt to have, have sitting there. So we're also calling on the federal government in October to provide emergency debt relief for those people and for retailers to, to match the government um, to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> Some really good points that you've made. Kim, do you have anything to add to that? On, on... I don't think I have anything yeah. to add to that because um, I completely agree with Kelly. Um, and I mean, at the moment, we've got advocacy in this space. Um, and so, yeah, redistribution of money. Yeah, succinctly put. <laughs> um, we have time for one final question, um, and I'd like to hear from each of you. Uh, when we stop and absorb the statistics and the like, the tragic stories that you've told about climate change, sometimes the future can feel quite bleak. But to finish up, I'm wondering if you could share something that you've seen or worked on in the context of climate change that gives you cause for hope. Who would like to go first? Suzanne? Um, I, this is at a very local level. I think that, it, it, you know, the, the people have bounced back in Lismore and businesses and, and homeowners that are really looking for ways to flood proof their home, which is hard to do, but that, that they're looking at how, what materials will we use? Um, you know, how, what can we do to, that is going to uh, lower the impact of another uh, disastrous event? Or other people who are looking, well, you know, 
moving place, moving their land, their homes in, in Lismore to a place where, you know, we can return that land to um, just being open land. So that gives me hope that people, that, that we're not just, they're not just going, throwing their hands in the air and saying, oh, you know, we just build back the same way we did. Um, and that's a very local level, but I think that people are really um, looking for ways to, to lessen the um, damage and destruction of next time. Thank you. I think with me, it's also my local community and um, also my community in the health sector because it's been growing. Really, people had their epiphany during the bushfires, a lot of people, and because I felt very alone back when I first started my advocacy, but now I have a community of people who are really joined in the last three years who've got a lot of energy. And uh, so I think human resources, which is human, really, it's our fellow community members uh, give me the greatest hope because, um, and the greatest resilience, because I think together as a, as a combined community, we can do so much. And like, what seems impossible is only possible when it's done. I think that um, that once we actually get the bulk of the community on board and more people understand, I think my feeling is I'm hoping it will actually shift to reach the turning point for our community with the cultural change because we need the cultural change and the people to understand before we actually can have meaningful action. I'm going to take my hope to a high high level um, and and I mentioned some of this before the new federal government it, we're seeing action we're seeing action from the state governments as well um, and I mentioned Victoria's announcement today the Queensland state government announced a big um, energy plan just a couple of weeks ago as well with a commitment to transition away from coal included in their plan was um, working with well, support for transition for workers and communities as well, which is just fantastic to see. That's probably one area where we've just, you know, people are talking about it, but we haven't seen governments actually take action on that. Um, so that, you know, I'm just, I'm really hopeful that the, the politics, the politicians are starting to get it right. Um, the federal government, in addition to their legislative and climate change target. They've got a consultation paper out at the moment on electric vehicle transition, where again, there's opportunity and, and other transport where there's opportunities here for people on low income. They will, they've announced the development of the national energy performance strategy, um, which is energy efficiency and demand, um, which they'll be releasing a consultation paper on soon. Again, so many opportunities here. Uh, for the community and people on low income to benefit from that. Um, so, the, you know, I'm, I'm starting to feel really hopeful that there's momentum. Um, and also, you know, to Suzanne and Kim's point about local communities, I think we're also hearing more and more people, um, you know, tell companies what they want to see and and local government and and others um, more activism is what I'm also seeing and I think that's really important because that's what's going to drive the politics for change um, not just within government but also within business as well thank you so much Kelly and um, I mean, to add to everything that everyone said, um, your work, uh, the three of you and Anne, um, brings me hope as well. The fact that people are doing work on climate change um, on all these different levels, doing work to help other people, and especially having that, uh, always having that lens on equity and the justice um, and injustice of climate change. Being at the fore um, is something that gives me great hope as well. 
So with that, um, we're going to wrap up. That brings us to the end of the 2022 Rosalie Rendu Forum on this crucial topic of climate justice. So everyone, please join me in thanking our panelists, Dr. Kim Liu, Kelly Court, Suzanne Nichols, and also Professor Anne Paulina, who had to um, leave us earlier. And thanks again to everyone who joined us tonight. Um, take care and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you. And thanks, Amy. Thank thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you.